In the early 90s, Nintendo was a safe haven for Japanese role-playing games. Arguably the most popular titles like Dragon Quest from Enix and Final Fantasy from Square were the games that fans of the genre considered for owning a Nintendo console. However, with the release of Final Fantasy VII and Square's decision to jump ship from 2D to 3D with the PlayStation, Nintendo lost a valuable asset in their gaming inventory. It also did not help when Enix and Square officially merged into one big company back in April of 2003. As far as JRPG goes, most Japanese developers and their English localizations have jumped into the PlayStation bandwagon in that era. If one would look at the JRPG lineup that was released in the West, the Nintendo consoles since the Nintendo 64 pales in comparison with the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, and PlayStation 3. Although the Nintendo Wii had popular exclusive Japanese role-playing games that were localized, there were only a few to choose from that really captured the old-school JRPG sensibilities yet also trying out something new. On my search for the next JRPG to play and review, one game has struck my curiosities above all else within Nintendo Wii's limited JRPG catalog. On this time spoiler review, we are going to talk about Arkwright's Fantasia for the Nintendo Wii. Arquest Fantasia on the surface is a mismatch of every Japanese role-playing game from the 90s and 2000s. From the character design, the gameplay and other formulaic ingredients that makes a decent JRPG. In fact, Hiroyuki Kanemaru, the director of this game, also worked under Tales of Symphonia for the Nintendo GameCube. As the player continues on with the game, the influences of other JRPGs tends to show. The game was made by Ignition Entertainment, Marvelous Entertainment, and Image Epoch, released exclusively for the Nintendo Wii on June 2009 in Japan and July 2010 in North America. Arkwise Fantasia revolves around the musings of a teenage mercenary named Lark. After meeting a mysterious girl named Lithia, his world was turned upside down with a strange chain of events ranging from jealousy, deception, betrayal, conspiracy, invasion, insurrection, and even mass genocide. Like previous games before it, the game's world is entrenched into war between an empire and a republic with another third party dipping its toe to instigate things further. Kinda sounds like Star Wars. Apparently this world is facing certain doom from a particular poison that turns everything into lifeless crystals. All major parties of this world must get their act together to find a solution. It is then revealed that the main characters must choose between two laws so that humanity can survive. Choose the law where the common folks will be saved, or choose a law that the divine race would carry on. The main characters will have to choose a side based on their motivations. The lead character thinks of a third option to save everyone but in order to do that, they need to collect all of these mystical and powerful entities so they have enough strength to convince the gods that govern this world the salvation of all humans. The characters will find out the hard way that their past and current relationships will help shape their decisions whether the needs of the many truly outweighs the needs of the few. Kinda sounds like Star Trek. To oversimplify the other facet of the game, I can tell it to you like this. Main boy meets main girl, main girl follows main boy, main boy meets best friend, main boy meets childhood friend, main girl wants main boy to help her save the world, main boy reluctantly and naively helps the girl, childhood friend gets jealous of main girl, best friend apparently loves childhood friend, 
childhood friend turns to the dark side to battle main boy's method to save the world. Best friend follows childhood friend, believing their way to save the world is better. Other characters choose a side. Let's fight to the death. Speaking about the characters, the design of each one is not that different from other JRPG characters, but surprisingly, their overall appearances are not overly complicated with frills, ribbons, belt buckles, and straps. That being said, they are not totally generic. Each one has their own backstories and motivations that they will get ample opportunities to develop all throughout the game. But as far as their roles go, you got someone swinging a big ass sword, someone using a staff, someone using a knife, someone using a saber blade, someone using guns, someone brawling with their fist, and someone who is the fan service character with her boobs almost popping out. The story of Arkwright's Fantasia is told using visual novel style. A character's picture will be shown doing an emotional pose depending on the dialogue. Every once in a while, there will be some 3D rendered cutscenes in key moments of the game. Speaking of influences from Tales of games, there will also be dialogue skits that will show up depending on where you are or which characters you currently have in your party. These skits have no really overall effect on the main storyline, but it sure does give some depth to your character's personality and some clues about where to go or what to do next. If it's not the overachieving plot, it is where the battle system that Arkwright's Fantasia flexes its muscle. It is turn-based, where you can see in the lower right of the screen which character is going to act next. You can have four combatants on your side of the field, with the fourth character as a guest only and only controlled by the AI. Each movement requires action points or AP to be spent. Depending on the chosen movement, the characters can either act before or after the enemies. The same logic applies to the enemies as well. Characters have their own unique special attacks, and if you make the right combinations, you can unleash a team attack right afterwards to inflict more damage. Magic can be learned by acquiring or creating elemental orbs. More powerful magic can be unlocked on the later chapters of the game. To use magic, of course, you're going to need magic points. Think of them like materials from Final Fantasy. Speaking of Final Fantasy, by gathering the aforementioned mystical and powerful entities, you can also summon them in combat as long as you have enough summoning points. Unfortunately, the leading man is the only person who has this ability. In most JRPGs, the equipment can alter the stats of your characters. In Arkwright's Fantasia, however, everything but the weapons themselves adds more to your attack points. To compensate for this lack of function, the weapons are blessed with skill effects. By acquiring weapon points after the battle, you can learn these skills and then transfer them to the next new weapon you come across. But each weapon has a secret effect. The weapons has 16 blocks, forming a 4x4 square. The effects look like Tetris shapes, and you need to fill out the whole square to unlock the secret effect. The secret effect is only exclusive to that weapon, so if you prefer a weapon with a specific secret effect, you might carry that weapon equipped with other regular effects until the very end of the game, until something better is available. The other downside is that once the skill effect is placed on a weapon, it is there. No other weapon can have it unless you move it to something else, meaning that only one person who has that weapon will have the added effects. At best, you can only have a maximum of 5 to 6 effects in a weapon, and some of those effects can be so trivial that they will only activate in specific conditions. For the most part, you can pretty much explore the overall map as far as the land can take you. There are lands that are full of vegetation, making it hard to navigate, a desert, a snowfield, a mountain range, and a few islands. Once you get the ability to fly, you will be awarded the ability to be transported automatically to the places where you have been before. Some towns are so rushly designed that getting in and out will take seconds and there are some cities that are so intricately made that it could take minutes just to enter and exit. Not to mention you can also get some items by talking to the NPC, ramsacking the houses, and plucking stuff out of the nook and crannies of each location. As for the dungeons, they can be pretty straightforward and easily navigated. There are no random encounters since the enemies can be seen lollygagging around the paths and even in the world map. There will be at times where you need to solve mini puzzles to continue on, but they are not too difficult to solve. As far as the side quest goes, you have the mercenary guild to keep you busy frolicking all over the world. There are not a lot, but you will definitely spend some time looking for some people, vanquishing specific monsters, and gathering requested materials. Mm -hmm. 
The soundtrack is good, but not really memorable. I say that because over the years of playing JRPGs, there are only a few games that have music and themes that really stuck out in my head. Strange. It's sunny, but it's raining. Ah, uh, the devil must be beating his wife. Who? Beating his what? Now it is time to talk about the elephant in the room. The voice acting. My prince, I don't know if you should be so familiar with the common legionnaire. The English localization for this game is one of the worst that I have ever heard. Ah! Help me! I don't want to die! Help me, Mr. Lark! The voices are just fine. It is the acting that gives Arkwright's Fantasia its bad reputation. You're hurt. Let me heal you with magic. Yes, please. To be honest, I was trying to give the game the benefit of the doubt and thought that the acting will eventually pick up. Ah! Two hours in the game and clearly I realized that I cannot stand much longer. And this game is heavy in dialogue. I had to download the undubbed version just so that I can finish the game. By the time I finished the game, it felt like they could have added a little bit more into it on how things are resolved with each of the characters' personal dilemmas. Not even a few excerpts of what happened to each of them was shown after the final twist was revealed. Perhaps it was just so anticlimactic to me that they ended just like that. Overall, I would give the game a 7.5 out of 10. I did have fun with the game despite some of the major flaws that I pointed out. This is still a solid JRPG, and given that Nintendo Wii only has a limited localized library of these kinds of games, it is a must-have for game collectors. For those of you who have also played Arkwright's Fantasia, did you like the game? Give your thoughts down there at the comment section. And as always, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, share, and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And turn on that notification bell for future content. This is Joe RPG. See you next time. Bye bye.